Well, once again, thank you everyone for coming. This is the last brown bag for the semester and also the academic year, but we'll be sending out a schedule for brown bags next year and maybe even looking for volunteers to participate. I don't know uh, what, what the um, lineup is like yet. Uh, so today I want to um, spend the time that we have and don't worry, I have another meeting I have to be to at 3 anyways, at 3 o'clock, so I know some of you have to leave early. Um, today I want to just give some basic introduction, introduction through terminology, but also introductions through examples of archives, um, um, including um, um, issues and debates that surround um, the construction of and the purpose of archives and how archives are intended to be used and who has access to them. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about what it looks like to either deposit with an existing archival repository or else to consider constructing your own. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about how archives and archival development matter as more than just the output to a project, but they also matter in terms of your own professional development and they matter in terms of how you are able to um, kind of identify the different phases and processes in terms of your own professional development. And then just some examples of archival projects that have or continue to run through uh, the IRIS Center or make use of some IRIS resources. Um, so, uh, so first of all, uh, let's see. I want to make sure, sorry, yeah. So let's start with some terminology, um, including what is an archive, who are archives for, how can ar archival material be used? Are they just, um, are they just places for storage? Um, um, in other words, if they are places for storage, then who gets access to the materials that are stored there? How are, they to be, how are those materials to be stored? And if they can be used as objects of ongoing in inquiry um, and, and research, how should they be used? Um, what are some of the debates surrounding that? Um, I don't have any fixed answers, by the way. I'll just give um, some uh, ideas and some positions that I have um, come across in my own life. And then also one of the big questions with archives is how do you catalog the material that go into archives to be stored? Uh, do you make use of your own standards or should you adopt standards that are already out there? Um, and actually in my own life I've seen a variety of different ways of um, adopting standards. Um, so uh, we'll be talking a lot about metadata. So a, a very basic definition is that an archive um, is in some sense a collection, but it's more than a collection. Again, there are discussions about collections versus curations. Uh, so often when we collect, um, we're thinking very carefully about how that collection will be organized um, and um, how, to, um, yeah, how, to, how to do that organization and what types of um, organizing characteristics are um, important. Uh, but uh, primarily in, in, my, in my line of work, which is language documentation, the goal is to preserve um, materials. Um, either to preserve, um, so archives um, have historically been and continue to be physical, but nowadays you often see digital archives or some combination of physical and digital archives. So they pr preserve documents and other materials um, about a place, for example, a group of people, an individual, a period of time. Um, so those are some of the ways that um, archives are created. Um, so here's an uh, example to get started. Uh, this archive houses um, bibliographies and also bio sketches and links to selected um, reading materials uh, that fit a particular um, characteristic they have to contain information on at least three women's biographies. So that's what this archive is. It's a collection of women's biographies. Um, so the time period there is, is specific. I'm not exactly sure what's going on with more contemporary um, materials. Um, and this was designed and supported by uh, the University of Virginia, which actually houses a number of really outstanding and interesting archives. So it's a good place to go to if you want to see how um, different archives look. Um, in terms of archive audiences and users, um, I'm giving you some examples now of um, archives that I myself have either worked with or um, I'm just making sure I'm up to speed on my notes. Um, in terms of language, um, la uh, linguistic material archives, so here are two archives, one's housed at the University of California 
the lower one here, and this one on the right is housed at the University of Texas. And they are both repositories, repositories I'm sorry, for audio, video, and text, in this case scanned, scanned to digital image, text information on um, native, uh, languages native to um, North America, Central America, and, and South America. So um, that's the California Languages Archive and AYA, the Archive of Indigenous Languages of Latin America. Um, these are pre-existing uh, archives, so they have their own managerial structure and their own server space uh, already in place at these two institutions. And so what typically happens is people who are doing language documentation work, if they're doing recording or if they're working with all old materials that they're scanning to digital format, they contact the archival repository first and they say, I have a project and here are the materials that we're going to generate and I would like to preserve these materials with your organization. And so uh, a lot of these places then have um, terms and conditions of depositing set up um, on their pages. So I know the print is tiny here, it's more just an idea to give you a visual um, and I will have the, these slides up online anyway so they'll be easy to go to. Um, but um, in most cases, the, the, you get the ball rolling by registering as a user of their archive and then reaching out to their managerial staff. But these, these are nice because they lay out the access levels that you can think about. So if you deposit material with the archive, uh, you have the option. Um, typically what happens is you have the option in consultation with the community that you're working with. And there may also be, uh, in this case, language communities who want to archive their own materials. So you set access levels for users uh, in the future to have access to different materials in different ways, different permissions. Uh, so for example, AYA has um, public access and restricted access, and so you can designate these uh, different access levels. And then within restricted access, the restriction can become um, um, increasingly more limited uh, depending on who you are when you um, register as a user or who you are accepted to be as a user. Um, and then um, if the materials you're depositing also include a degree of curation, which is a kind of perhaps careful organization and selected presentation according to, for example, different themes or different genres in the case of um, language, especially if you're archiving um, discourse or narratives um, or um, other types of continuous speech. Uh, and then you can also have these embargo degrees, so access is not permitted for a certain period of time until a certain amount of time has passed by, and so on and so forth. So, um, so that's one thing to keep in mind if you're depositing material, or even if you are building your own archive and you want different levels of access to the materials that are stored there. Um, yeah, it's always uh, something that we say in any case, if you are working with an existing archive, reach out to the directors and the managers right away with questions. Um, and then this also helps you to think about how you want to organize the material that you deposit, how you, um, how you want to send that material to a pre-existing archive and how you would like them to work with it. Um, yeah, I also wanted to just say, uh, in, in a kind of say this right away, that an archive is not the same as a web page, um, or at least a digital archive is not the same as a web page. Um, so uh, this has become a, a, bit, a bit of a hot topic in language documentation because um, in certain areas where um, documentation initiatives are really picking up effort and perhaps being done at a grassroots level, even by native speakers in those communities, these are people who might have a degree of web access and they may even have some web development skills and so they, they, the initial idea is to put things online and um, as, a, as a potential, uh, in, in the, it's in the cloud so it will be stored and so therefore it's an archive. But I just want to um, kind of underscore that that's um, not the same thing as the archival process that I'm talking about here. There are a number of issues that come up, for example the longevity, um, how, how long, wherever you're, you know, whoever's hosting your material, how long will that hosting uh, go on for? What other um, types of information are you bringing to the organization of the materials that you're putting there? Do, did you actually have permission to sto um, host the materials that you've stored there and so on and so forth? Um, are you making use of metadata standards that other people will be able to work with even like presumably a hundred years from now when you're no longer around to explain what certain file naming conventions or in, in the case of linguistics other types of ontology and coding decisions are being made. However, having said that, many digital on archives have really nice, exciting, interesting, kind of lure you in web exhibit interfaces 
uh, that really can make, uh, especially if an archive is accessible for public use, if it's out there for as a public research tool, can make archives really attractive. So it's something to keep in mind if you are building your own archive, whether or not you want to have um, some kind of a web exhibit interface alongside um, this. So the Walt Whitman has a nice kind of um, news and updates and some other exhibits they'll have blogging functions where people can raise discussions about um, material contained in the archive or how they might be making use of materials. Um, if, particularly if archives are um, a multi-person endeavor and the materials are being used for research, then publications linked to the data might be um, accessed there, uh, kind of bibliographies. Um, you can put a lot of um, affiliated information, like who's supporting the archive, who's funding it, what the managerial structure, or is there a steering committee involved. If you are networking with scholars from other institutions, for example, all of that can be found there. And it can really, I think, add a lot of value to the archive. So the Walt Whitman um, archive is a, is a really great example of that. Um, Having said that, again, um, language archives are really start, they've over the past, you know, I guess, let's say 20, 25, 30 years, digital language archives have really kind of exploded in terms of number. And there are a lot of really good ones out there. And um, um, people who do documentation, especially if they're looking for funding now, they have to really think about where they might like to store their data because they have so many more options in addition to the shoebox under their bed, better options than that. Um, but one of the problems um, that remains, or one of the challenges perhaps, or opportunities on the research side of things is how to harmonize deposits from different um, archival <coughs> collections to work, use together if you, want to, um, if you want to and you have access to archival materials for your own work. So as an example, um, I do my field work in Nepal, in South Asia, and there, there is currently no um, kind of um, big, uh, you know, well-established, let's say, archival organization based itself in South Asia. So people who do language documentation work in South Asia look to other archives that are located in other parts of the world that may include Nepal and South Asia in its kind of geographic or um, uh, ling like linguistics internal kind of specific scope of, of where materials go. So I've archived materials uh, in repositories in the United Kingdom. Um, I've archived materials um, in the United States and um, with a grant application that we have out, if, if we're successful, we'll deposit materials to an archive that's in Australia. So that these are in really different places and the archives look kind of quite different and materials get accessed in different ways and the managers ask you to organize your materials in slightly different ways. And so the challenge is then harmonizing access to those materials such that you can actually make use of the materials in parallel ways. This is uh, particularly challenging in linguistics if you want to use, for example, text data. So narratives, procedural texts, um, conversational material as a way to carry out kind of more, let's say more linguistics research. If you want to make use of the um, transcribed and translated data, for example, to look at syntactic structure in these languages or to look uh, further explore the lexicon, um, it's really hard to harmonize how these materials are set up. And so in, in this case, something's being done about it. The uh, University of North Texas <coughs> is putting together a consortium uh, that they call CORSEL which is really at this point now a series of discussion, focused discussion groups about how that might look. And those discussion groups can um, include archival managers, um, special collection librarians, linguists, of course, um, and other um, um, people who kind of have a stake in this type of question. So there was a, um, a, pu a publication released uh, recently that came out of one of their discussion groups. And one of the two big challenges that were recognized is first of all, um, um, the scholar's personal connection to data, how, so if, if there is a harmonal, uh, harmonizing process, what does that mean for how the scholar views um, his or her data that they work with? Concerns that the data collection and preparation will never be fully complete. The difficulty of updating established deposits and getting fair credit and, uh, for their effort. And also the difficulty in finding relevant data, difficult search functions, inconsistent applications of um, metadata citation and attribution and, and so on and so forth. So, um, Okay, turning a little bit to some of the, the actual technical terminology, some of the um, definition here. 
um, really, I think one of the biggest, um, uh, again, I feel like all I'm talking about is challenges here, but one of the biggest early challenges to think about when working with archives is what does metadata mean? You know, metadata are just simply data about your data. So when you do a recording, or if you're working with a scanned image or an image that you're about to scan from paper, um, and then you're about to consider putting, putting this into part of a larger co um, collection, you have to think about this object now and how the file that, um, that contains this now uh, digital image or, or audio video file, how that's going to be named and how that naming might relate to other files that are part of that collection. Um, and so at least again in linguistics, um, there have been some standards proposed um, and they fall along these main, this main list of characteristics. We have to be concerned with content. But, so I, I'm saying this about linguistics, but I feel like this is not too different from what we might find in other disciplines. So there are concerns about content, format, discovery, access, citation, preservation. Preservation is kind of part of the larger umbrella. And also rights. And so I just wanted to briefly you know, I, um, uh, turn to these. So in terms of uh, content, what is typically referred to in language documentation and archivals, archiving process is a, is a um, standard ontology. Um, so basically that just means standards for naming and describing and defining objects in a collection. And so I look to what is happening within language documentation as a whole, but linguistics and anthropology are also heavily overlapping disciplines. So I look at how ontologies and anthropology are also being developed. And so, um, and particularly since I'm often dealing with linguistic data, um, we're thinking about ontologies at the level of grammatical analysis as well, particularly if you're depositing word lists or elicitation sets, sets of elicited, controlled elicited data that um, fall under some research questions, for example, having to do with morphosyntax or semantics. Um, format has become increasingly important because there are so many formats out there that are proprietary. They may be awesome and you can do really cool things with them in software or applications that you pay a lot of money for and that only work on certain operating systems. But the goal here is to have file formats that are accessible kind of anywhere by anybody at any point in time. How can we read into the future? Even I don't know, I'm always learning more about which formats are the best formats to be used. For, take for example image files. I used to um, be told that TIFF files were the file that we should be saving still images as. Uh, now I'm hearing more about JPEG, and JPEG seems to be the way to go, and then there's um, subformats under JPEG that seem to be better than others, so I feel like I'm always learning something. Um, <clears throat> is, with respect to some of these other, um, with some of these other metadata categories, basically, again, we're, you're just thinking about um, how the information, how the primary information surrounding a data set might be cataloged. In my case, when I'm doing audio video recording, um, it's important to know um, the date and time of the session, the location, who are the different participants involved, not only in front of the camera, but behind the camera. Once the file has been captured, or once the video has been captured and is now a file, if it goes through an editing phase, who's a part of that, and what are the editing standards, and so on and so forth. So there's a long line of people and processes that all need to be captured um, and recorded at some level. So every you know, one video takes then men much longer to work with in terms of cataloging and, and holding all of that information. Uh, let's see, what more do I wanna say about that? Um, yeah, and then of course, administrative information connected to the workflow completion and also access. To, um, so all the, the video recording that I do and also the audio recording I do in Nepal um, comes with it a discussion before the um, the video takes place about who might have access to this video, um, who, uh, you know, um, to what extent are participants anonymous, um, and so on and so forth. So all of that happens before the camera's ever even turned on. Uh, let's see, what did I want to say about this slide? Yeah, meta more about metadata. So often when you're working in pre-existing archives, and particularly if you end up building your own archive, I'll, I'll mention um, Omeka a little bit more in a few minutes. You're working with a, uh, a, a, um, a metadata standard that's t uh, typically known as the Dublin Core. Um, and the Dublin Core um, 
is essentially just a set of 15 properties to use in naming and describing items. Um, even I don't know all the 15 properties by heart, and I should by now. Uh, they, and, and then you can, um, you can work with these as well. You can add additional um, cataloging properties as, as well, and I'll show you an example of an archive that I've worked with that uses the Dublin Core plus additional properties. But the Dublin Core properties include um, contributor, coverage, creator, format, identifiers, language, publisher, relation, rights, source, subject, title, and item type. So um, th this is easily found by searching online, and I think if I didn't, I will add it that um, Dublin Core has its own homepage. And these, these, I would say also that these properties are periodic periodically reviewed, and there's discussions around them as well. So that's the Dublin Core page is a good place to go to, to find out more about what these properties are and how they're used. And so if you are working, for example, in an exhibit builder like Omeka, so Omeka is primarily an exhibit builder, but it does have a really good setup as well for archives. Um, then when you add items and when you work items into collections and then when you build them into curated exhibits, you're working with um, item type uh, metadata as well as um, Dublin Core standards. So, uh, Let's see. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show you an example of how I work with slight, slight variations of that in my own work. So um, with one of the projects I have going on in Nepal, we are archiving video um, texts, and those texts cross all kinds of genres. Some of them are um, narratives, kind of bi um, autobiographies, um, or narratives that are, are more kind of legends or creation stories. Some of them are texts of procedures, like how to make this or how to do that or how something is observed or practiced. Some of these are more kind of oral histories of a particular location or of a particular event. Um, there are a lot of natural disasters where I work in Nepal, so there are, are floods and avalanches and earthquakes, and people like to tell, talk about those um, and talk about what this means for you know, their lives and, and where they live. So, um, so these, all of these na um, narratives get archived in a pre-existing system that's already set up. This is um, through a, um, a digital library housed within the University of Virginia's main library system. So it's a special collections library, digital library. It's called the Tibetan Himalayan Library, THL. And they have this multimedia platform for housing um, sounds and videos and other, also images and scanned maps. Um, called Shanti, it's their Shanti system. It's the Science and Humanities, oh, I forget, it's, it's an acronym, um, I'm, it's blanking on me right now, but it's a, it's, an, um, it's a basically a digital initiatives network for housing all of these different types of objects within their library. And so when you go to um, deposit materials, so I worked with the, um, the director and also their um, tech support to um, think about the best way to house the materials that I had recorded. And um, <clears throat> since uh, what I had was a, a large set of videos with companion transcripts, and each of the transcripts were represented in um, three languages plus a bunch of um, linguistics metadata on top of them. So we, we devised a system. They work on a content management system platform known as Drupal. And I don't know much about Drupal from the programming angle. They set things up for me, and then I just go in and work with it. But it's kind of fun in some ways to work with. And so their metadata, their kind of cataloging, and their, um, <clears throat> their properties system makes use of the, um, the Dublin Core kind of 15 properties. But they've also created this fairly rich catalog of um, subject terms and other types of metadata that are specific to the Tibetan Himalayan region. And they call them knowledge maps or K maps. And their K maps cross, um, they, 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 they fall into two major categories. One is subjects and one is location. And I'm not exactly sure how and why they differentiate subject from location because they cross with each other quite a bit. But whenever we um, deposit a new item, whenever we add a new item to one of the several collections that we're building, we have the option, in addition to the um, the 15 core properties I just mentioned working within this set of, of, um, of essentially um, subject tags that we're adding. adding. And so those are um, particular to the narrative that's, um, that we're adding. So that it, ba it basically enhances the searchability of items within their library. So if somebody wants to look for, for example, 
narratives about the 2015 earthquakes in Nepal in which the, the narrator also provides some kind of a religious or spiritual explanation to um, why the earthquakes happened, um, they can do a more enhanced search in that way and, and kind of come up with appropriate um, videos. Because we have you know, several dozen videos about the earthquakes, but not all of them talk about the religious dimension of the earthquakes. Others talk more about relief efforts <coughs> or NGOs or the government or the government's lack of response or so on and so forth. So um, yeah, so uh, just this is an example of a deposit. This is one um, item in the larger collection. Um, this is not from the earthquake um, corpus, so this is from the other, uh, another project that I have running. So this is a man who, in, in this particular case, he's telling a story about, um, he's telling a story about a religious structure that's important to his community. So. Um, and then with other archival projects that I've worked in, uh, metadata has gone a little bit differently. Uh, so this is one of my first documentation and archival efforts way back in 2011 and 2012. And I w at this time, again, I was depositing material in a pre-structured archive. And they had me send all my metadata in a rich text format. Uh, because At the time, they were ra radically redeveloping how metadata was supposed to be encoded. So even then, this archive was kind of un undergoing its own internal transformation. So um, they had me send all of the technical and subject metadata from all of my deposit into a massive rich text file. Uh, they did that because they didn't want it to be kind of proprietary Microsoft Excel. They wanted it to be kind of a neutral file that they could manipulate in different ways. But nowadays, if, if one gets funding to archive through this repository, this is in the United Kingdom, <clears throat> they have their own app that you download. It's called IMDI, or C it's becoming now CMDI. So it used to be called MD. It's turning into SIMD or KIMD. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it anymore. But it's an app, and it has a YouTube video, and it shows you how to add different types of properties, different types of um, encoding and cataloging information with any kind of object that you're um, adding to the archive. So, uh, Let's see. Yeah, OK, I wanted to pivot a little bit to talk about some issues and debates. They've been coming up already with respect to some of the t uh, t terminology I've covered already. Um, <coughs> So this became really a hot, a hot discussion point for me. I was actually I visited the um, AAA in December, their annual meeting. That's uh, um, the anthropology annual meeting. It was in Washington D.C., and I was a part of an all-day workshop on archiving for anthropologists who do document language documentation, um, so field work. And uh, so we were talking a little bit about um, the image the image of. Um, uh, archives in uh, parts of the world where they've worked. And historically, in certain parts of the world, uh, archives have been really linked to privilege and power. And so they, um, the idea of working with a community and then saying that you're going to deposit that material in some, in some exterior, some outside of the community um, repository, really provoked a lot of emotions and fears and concerns. And so I, felt, I feel um, like it would be remiss for me to not kind of bring up this history here and that to some extent this still um, this this concern is still real uh, depending on which discipline you're working in so um, basically um, much linguistic anthropology field work and and perhaps you know this would be true about histo history as well this historically produced archival material on former territories in which you had outside occupiers and so and the archives themselves they were viewed as these kind of detached official institutional objects and therefore were viewed as an extension of power structures and power asymmetries. Um, and so, and the archives that w maybe were thought of as holding people's secrets or holding information that could be used um, by one power structure against an hour, another power structure. <clears throat> and um, therefore, the people who participated in archiving activities were seen as gatekeepers, and they were somehow part of that power structure. Um, uh, and also, um, scholars were often outsiders coming into a community that was not their own community. And so they were therefore subject to misanalysis, or e deliberate or otherwise analysis of what they were viewing and the types of materials they were collecting. Um, and uh, only up until recently now are we really seeing informed consent being enforced. This is uh, one of the things I talk about a lot in a research methods class that I'm teaching now with my TESOL, teaching, of Eng teaching English as a second language students. 
we're looking at a lot of academic, you know, journal articles, academic literature, and, um, and we're reading the literature for, of course, um, an analysis of the research methods and the data that are generated and how the author analyzes the data and what kinds of hypotheses and conclusions they come to. But we're, I'm also asking them, so, you know, who did they gather data from? Humans. Okay, let's find the human subjects and informed consent disclaimer. And of course, almost none of the articles up that are, let's say, prior to 2016 have any kind of information about ethics or human subjects. And so the, it's, the assumption is that somehow the, that the scholar received clearance, but we'll never know for sure. Uh, so, but now, starting after 2016, a lot of these journal articles now have these, um, they look to be official mandatory disclaimers at the bottom where the author has to acknowledge that they've gone through an informed consent process. And I would say archives up to a certain point were also guilty of this, that they, they didn't make it clear to what extent the material were gathered with the um, community's explicit knowledge and consent. Um, and, and especially if the material were, were on any level to be made available to the public or for public consumption and research. Um, so, you know, I as a researcher may think that the story that I've just recorded from somebody is going to be so valuable and so exciting. You know, somebody's telling me, for example, about death rituals in their community. Oh, this is so valuable. This is culturally valuable, ling linguistically valuable. But it may be knowledge that the, the person who's giving me the story in the community uh, the community who, who are, are participating in, in that um, storytelling don't really want to have known as public information. So um, that's an awareness maybe that scholars haven't always um, acknowledged um, or been aware of, yet, yeah, themselves aware of. However, um, just because these, um, there are these lingering historical issues, uh, I think that archives serve a very important process uh, or serve a very important role in the larger process, at least in, in my world of language documentation and preservation. Um, um, in many cases with North American languages, a good archive will bring the dead to life once the last speakers are gone. Um, a lot of the languages that we work with now, it's not a question of if the language will die, it's a question of when the language will die. So um, really, we're, we're collecting information perhaps for future kind of resurrection use. Um, and archives can also be mediators. They can be contact zones uh, between different groups. Um, and um, uh, as is kind of, uh, you know, as is um, brought up a lot nowadays with talks about language endangerment and language archives, doing nothing is simply not an option. Um, not only are languages endangered, but the data that people who do documentation on itself is also endangered. If it does live in a shoebox under your bed, um, the file format will become, um, it will become out of date and become unusable after a period of time. Um, I was, uh, when, in my first year of my PhD, we were told um, to use mini disc recorders for data collection. I don't know if any of you recall the time of the mini disc recorder. There's now virtually no um, equipment out there that can read uh, from or work with mini discs. Um, DAT recorders were also a big part of my language documentation back in the 1990s. If you try to find a DAT player or a DAT recorder on, for example, Amazon or eBay now, they're thousands of dollars because they just aren't around. There's just so few of them left. Even CDs, so of course we were putting everything on CD-ROMs, they have about a 15-year lifespan before that data is unusable. So um, really, you know, archives and the archival managers are the ones who stay on top of these format conventions and, and help you help your data to become um, as preservable as possible. Okay, and then um, we've got a small audience here. I didn't know if there were people who were eventually thinking about applying for funding to support research that would eventually result in either deposit or the building of an archive. But um, it's worth saying that most funders now require um, something that's called a data management plan. And so for work in um, anthropological field work or linguistic field work, they want to know where you're going to store your data and who has access to it and how long, you know, for how long do you imagine this data will be usable. So this is, I'm not going to go through this exhaustively, but this is an example from the National Science Foundation and the types of questions that they want you to answer in a DMP, a data management plan. They usually give you like two pages to say all of this too, but you have to somehow respond to it. Okay. Um, I wanted to cover very briefly the difference between depositing and building because I'm, I'm going through both right now. Um, I've under, undertaken research, I've had been a part of research projects where the data that I 
gather the data that are generated from my field work. I have to do some front end work in terms of organizing and paying attention to file naming conventions and providing that basic uh, technical and participant and subject metadata, whether it's in a rich text or an Excel spreadsheet. And then I ship the whole batch off to somebody elsewhere and they receive it and they, what, they call, what they say is their, their um, archive ingests my material and then it's, that's where it is. It's, um, it will live there in perpetuity, hopefully. Um, and there's something nice about that because now someone else kind of gets to worry about, now I get to use the data that I gathered to do other things with. Maybe as a linguist, I'm always interested in phonetic analysis and phonological analysis. And now I have this great set of words I've recorded and I know that, you know, uh, a version of this now lives in the archive and so I can kind of work with the data in different ways and kind of feel relieved from um, depositing and storage tasks and concerns and questions. So if that's one route to go, then of course you're always thinking about wh what archive, what repository makes sense for the type of work you're doing. Um, and you want to be in touch with them as I mentioned before. You have to recognize that archives often can't do the work for free, so that you may need to work them into your budget plan. For the latest grant that I wrote, it was about 8% of the overall budget. Um, that's not, that's nothing to sneeze at, that's a good amount of money, because what often happens is um, um, at, at the repository, they need um, to continuously update their resources, they need to, need to keep maybe expanding their server space, and they need to somehow pay their technicians who maintain everything. So, uh, so considering that in your budget is very important. Um, and then, again, often with uh, language archives, you just go to the site and they'll often start giving you tips about how to organize your data. And that's, those are tips you can even bring to the field if you are a field worker. So you can start your file naming conventions early on. And for example, if you're, work if you're working with a certain um, quality of audio uh, data and audio material, you can pay attention to um, um, audio formatting conventions uh, early on. So before you even press the record button on your tape recorder, you can make sure that the uh, sound capture conventions are set to the minimum standards that the archive would like. Uh, and then consider your notebook to also be data that can be archived. So keep a notebook, scan your notebook, and consider uh, notebooks and other types of notes and information that you generate from your grant um, or your project to also be something that can be deposited. They're often thought of as derivatives, um, but they're important parts, I think, of the larger archive. Um, yeah, be aware, like I mentioned before, be aware of different format requirements and conversion requirements. Be aware that even um, innocent looking files or programs like Microsoft Excel, those are proprietary and uh, may not be readable um, 100, 150 years from now. Um, or on other types of operating systems. I mean, who knows if Apple's will still be around in 100 years or if uh, Windows will be the operating system. I don't know. Um, yeah, and this is one thing I've um, always been thinking about, and this is why I'm also pivoting sometimes to building my own archive. Be aware that once um, a repository ingests your materials, that to them is the final step in your data generation. And so you, if you suddenly decide that you need to think about something differently or you're analyzing something differently, you can't just continuously re, re, um, revise the archive, right? That's the final deposit. That doesn't mean like you, you, know, you made a mistake and so you're in big trouble or something. You, know, there, you can think about that in other ways and the future can correct your, you know, no, that's not a plural marker, that's a definite marker. These are, these are things that keep linguists up at night when they're doing uh, language documentation is how to analyze um, grammatically um, different forms in the language. Uh, however, if, you've, if you decide that you need to revise things, what the archive will ask is for you to submit a new version. Um, and then they may not allow that without extra funding. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about the timeline of the work that you're doing. Uh, let's see, yeah, yeah, uh, time pl planning. Or else you may um, end up depositing your larger deposit in chunks. You know, here's set A that I'm depositing, set B will be ready in another six months. These are all things you work out with the archive. But what I wanted to kind of turn to with the time I have left before I show a few um, illustrations 
is um, that it is possible to think about building your own archive, but you want to think about why you want to do that as well, because it's a lot of work and it requires a lot of um, content, discipline-specific knowledge about how you want materials to be housed, as well as technical knowledge and experience. And it's really hard for the same person to have both of those at the same time, I've realized in my life. So you have to be somebody who's willing to work well with others and have the budget and the capacity to bring others into your world and to talk with them about your vision and accept their advice, um, even if their advice somehow stands contra to how you initially viewed the archive as looking. And I'm saying, to this, saying all of this to you right now having lived it and, and living through it. Um, so it, it means talking with your home institution. What kind of support can you expect your institution to give you? What must you give back in return in order for this support to be ongoing? If it's a digital archive, what will the server space be? What will server access look like? If you don't have access to that, who does and how do you, what kind of a relationship do you have with those people? Um, what kind of um, platform and other applications do you need to know about in order to start constructing the archive? SIUE currently hosts Omeka, but there are a number of other excellent um, archival um, um, archive builders or exhibit builders that have archive features to them out there. So these are just a few that um, I'm familiar or like vaguely familiar with, but um, there, I'm sure there are others in addition. Um, your library will often know um, what kinds of platforms or um, types of uh, resources that may make most sense. Um, yeah, and then you want to think about the archive once you've moved on to other things in your life. So um, I'm building a, a very kind of specific, uh, you know, fixed archive with a fixed set of um, items arranged in fixed ways, and that money will run out eventually. And so how will that be maintained in the future or updated and so on and so forth? So that's something that, you know, I'm always thinking about. And then again, what will access be like? Um, what materials are available for others to work with? What must visitors do in order to get access to those materials? How must they cite or attribute the um, source from which they're getting that information? How may they use it? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, right now, um, Omeka uh, is the, uh, the CMS platform. It's primarily an exhibit builder, but it has great archival features. So um, if anyone in the audience who doesn't already know what I'm talking about is interested in learning more about Omeka, I would say your first stopping points would be the IRIS Center and also SIUE's ITS. Um, so um, it has pretty good cataloging and metadata capabilities, although some things are a little clunky to work with. Um, there's a newer release that's out there. We're working with the classic version still, but I don't know to what extent we may transition over to the newer generation. <clears throat> Katie and I have looked into Omeka S a little bit, but mm -hmm. that's, not, that's kind of a summer project. Yeah, it's right. That's so. So yeah. it's just it's just good to know that there is a newer a newer version out there now. Yeah. Um, it has a lot of cool themes and plugin abilities. For example, you can interface um, items or collections with other types of um, apps like um, Google Maps. That's a um, a very common one to link up. Um, and many of the IRIS projects, particularly the ones that I'll show you today, they have an archival feature that's linked up with or that exists in tandem with a web exhibit. Uh, yeah. And then as a last comment before I show you a couple of examples, I also um, have become really um, interested in, and engaged in a number of discussions, at least in the field of linguistics, about what archives um, mean to you as a professional, as a scholar who, whose, whose career and livelihood is tied to these types of activities. It used, to be, um, it used to be the basic idea that the archive just simply resulted, I'm sorry, the, the, the archive simply was representative of the output, the finish, um, and that really the, the, um, the effort of your, for example, field work was towards um, scholarship and contributing, for example, to uh, linguistics as a, as a discipline, as, a theory, as um, theories of, uh, of, um, of human language abilities and connections between language and the mind. 
Um, but there's been more and more realization that archival efforts and archival innovations are themselves their own um, aspiration and their own form of scholarly effort. And so um, this is starting to be recognized more and more so within institutions, for example, on promotion and tenure documents, um, archival or and within the larger kind of um, umbrella of digital uh, initiatives and digital humanities initiatives are being identified and named as activities that faculty can participate on for professional development and professional growth. Um, so more than just being supporting data, archives re represent really careful and sometimes painstaking and long-term decisions about organization, creation, workflow, and time management. Um, so, and also just uh, quite practically, um, as particularly for my work with the funding program of documenting endangered languages, I have to demonstrate that I've built something useful and systematic um, with, uh, with the archival deposit that I've done or the, the archive that I'm building. Um, there's now documents, there's now kind of language being released and published through a variety of venues articulating this so that um, scholars can bring this to their university professional development committees, um, promotion and tenure committees. So I just have a couple of examples there. And um, I was kind of hoping that others in the audience knew of um, examples coming out of their own disciplines where um, basically there is this public articulation of archival and archival um, activities as critical to, uh, for example, you know, I'm, I'm hired at SIUE as a linguist. I teach linguistics courses. I'm expected to undertake linguistics relevant scholarly activities. Traditionally, those were defined as um, writing journal articles or writing a book, um, but now they're also taking the form of the work that I do towards archival construction. So. Uh, okay, so yes, just some examples to close out um, the hour with. So of course, I'll start with the one I'm working on because I know more about it. So um, I received some rapid funding from the National Science Foundation in 2015 to collect uh, earthquake survivor stories across different ethno-linguistic communities in Nepal. Um, so I'm the director of this project, and most of the videos go to the University of Virginia's um, Tibetan and Himalayan library, but we had a number of other, um, we had a number of other materials that our research, our fieldwork generated that weren't that core set of, of videos. Um, in particular, a number of audio-only interviews, so they're more structured dialogues, they weren't free-flowing survivor story narratives. And so they didn't quite make sense in the UVA archive. And then we just had a number of other still images that our field workers took while they were in the field. And just a number of other project related outcomes, a lot of derivatives, a lot of uh, field notes and things like that. And so they didn't quite make sense at the University of Virginia. So I approached the NSF with that and they said, oh, you should apply for an REU. And if you're familiar with an REU, it's a supplement that you can apply for through existing funding. It's called a research experiences for undergraduates. And it lets you bring more money into your budget, but for specific causes and, and in specific ways. So I made the case that I could work with um, some undergraduate students, particularly at least one student who had content management um, system experience, some kind of programming experience, web development experience, and we would build our own archive at SIUE. It's a limited archive, it's small in scale, but it would house these materials. And, but more than that, we also wanted to build a companion web, web exhibit that gave context to the archive. What was this project about? Why were the earthquakes an important time in which to gather this material? So in a way, making a case for the project that went to a wider audience than just the reviewers at National Science Foundation. So the web exhibit um, basically um, contains, uh, let's see, I can maybe open it up briefly. Actually, I'll open it up here. Each browser, oh, this used to have, Safari so used to have the Nepal earthquakes as my homepage, but every now and then my browsers reset their homepage and I don't know why. So now I have to manually go there. Anyways, different browsers have different homepages for different projects. <laughs> uh, let's see, where am I? Not this one. If you 
like I have the URL memorized. Yeah, because I'm just, my eyes aren't seeing it. Oh, here it is. Oh, okay. It's very close. So here, here we have the, the exhibit. Thanks, though, Ben. So this is the web exhibit that introduces you to the project as a whole as well as the historical context. So my brilliant, wonderful undergrads are building this. Uh, I have one undergrad who's a computer science major and another undergrad who's an anthropology major, and they work very, very well together, actually. They both have web develop development experience. So the exhibit is really kind of giving basic information about the country, about the linguistic diversity, and also the historical context surrounding the earthquakes themselves. So news coverage and other types of information. Um, but that, there's a link that also takes you to the archive. Um, so this archive is built on an Omeka platform, and they did some customization to the Omeka platform to kind of thematically try to get it to blend into the exhibit a little bit more so that the imagery is there. And so what we have right now is three, um, three featured exhibits, and um, we may end up adding a fourth. This is the one we've primarily been working on, which is currently housing, like I said, those um, structured interviews and the transcripts to those interviews along with the still images. That, we, um, that were taken in, these, in this area. So this is currently under construction, but it's starting to take shape. And this is also where the derivatives will be housed. And so we're just trying, we're having discussions right now about where those derivatives, how they should look in the larger archive. Should they be their own exhibit or should they be broken into the different exhibits based on uh, coverage and topic and focus and so on and so forth. So that's just a quick um, overview of the um, Nepal earthquakes archive. And again, like I said, we're using WordPress for the online, for the exhibit, and we're using Omeka for the archive. And I think that, um, you know, similar types of um, setups uh, we could say about the other two that I'll quickly show you. So this is the Madison County Historical Online Encyclopedia and Archive. And again, it's an exhibit and an archive, and it's also a WordPress and Omeka, um, yeah. Uh, combination. So um, I'm not going to say much about this because I'm not involved in this project. Uh, the directors are members of the history department as, as well as a number of organizations and individuals. But they have quite a large team um, of people involved in this, including graduate students and, of course, our own Ben Ostermeyer. So, you know, I've, I'm just a visitor to this site when I go. I don't have access to the insides or the, the kind of looking under the hood here. But uh, going, visiting this site, particularly when you visit the archive in particular, you can search but according to various criteria. You can do um, time searches, thematic searches. And then, so in this case, I just had a quick look at um, kind of education, looking at school, the history of schools in different parts of the region. And when you call up particular items in different collections, you can see the arrangement. So in this case, this is a, um, a, a document, I'm sorry, a. Um, a readable document, and you used a, um, an application that gives it a kind of sliding view of the different pages, uh, along with different metadata that become available here. So, so that's the Madison County example. And then the final example I'll give you, because I, I'm starting to run out of time here, is work done by Jessica de Spain. So um, her, her archive, as well as is exhibit, is known as the Wide Wide World Digital Edition. And it is essentially an archive of the many different editions of a single novel, uh, a buildings roman. So a buildings roman is a kind of a, as I understand, a novel that involves a lot of um, coming of age and, and um, kind of the emotions and, and uh, per, um, kind of personal experiences of, of a central character. So um, yeah, Jessica de Spain directs this. Again, she has a number of students and other an editorial staff board, including other SIUE faculty and faculty from other institutions. Um, and again, what you are able to do is to search in a quite detailed way the insides of these different issued, these different editions of the same novel. Um, th these were also novels with a lot of illustrations, a lot of imagery in them, and also the cover design is quite significant based on where and when the different um, editions were issued. And so uh, they spent a lot of time scanning the original books to digital um, format and then annotating these digital images with various different types of information and cataloging as such. So again, a search uh, in one of the different editions um, will reveal particular pages and then you can find out via metadata and other types of uh, descripting, con descriptive con and naming conventions information. And one of the nicer tools, I think, in this larger exhibit is 
a comparative function. So you can compare different editions, in, different editions within the same kind of um, frame. And also in the past couple of years, different kind of curated, uh, what, what are called galleries, have been developed exploring different themes within the larger wide, wide world, world, I guess, the universe of the wide, wide world. So, Okay, those are the last examples. So I just wanted to say thank you. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. But um, thank you for coming today. And if anything, I hope I've kind of given an overview of just, you know, what, um, what really goes into thinking about archives and how um, it's a process that, at least in my experience, requires collaboration and um, cross-fertilization of ideas with other scholars. It's quite interdisciplinary. So, okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you.